You know what's tragic? A society like ours that's arguably the womb of free speech has developed a fatal blind spot, and it's undoing the progress that we made in over two centuries. I think Jordan Peterson's caution against political correctness in this conversation with Bill Maher will become a vital relic in history as one of the first times someone warned against it. Just watch this next clip before I tell you why. Why should your right to freedom of speech trump a trans person's right not to be offended? Because in order to be able to think, you have to risk being offensive. I mean, look at the conversation we're having right now. You know, like you're certainly willing to risk offending me in the pursuit of truth. Why should you have the right to do that? It's been rather uncomfortable. In order to be able to think, you have to risk being offensive. And that went viral. That made you very famous. Why do you think that sparked such a reaction? Well, because I think that what I was saying was self-evidently true, but not expressed very well very often. I mean, look, most of the time when you're discussing something that needs to be discussed, everybody's actually rather upset about it. You know, if you're actually talking right. about something sure. important, right? Because why talk otherwise, unless you're just shooting the breeze? But if there's an issue at hand that has to be discussed, then people are already upset and they have different viewpoints. And, and the, the, the offensiveness in some sense is built into that. And you know that because if you have a family, if you have a wife, if, if you have an intimate relationship and you're discussing something that's difficult, the probability that you're not going to offend each other if you're actually having the conversation is zero. And so you don't have to think unless you have a problem. And if you have a problem, then when you think, you're going to offend people. And so, so what, are we not going to think? That seems like a bad idea. You're uh, obviously not an American. Um, <laughs> we love to not think. <laughs> but, but, you know, I used to do a show called Politically Incorrect mm. back in the 90s. And, and so I was always asked, what is your definition of political correctness? And I, would, I had to come up with one. I said, it's the elevation of sensitivity over truth. Mm -hmm. Which seems like what it still is, except it's worse than ever. Mm -hmm. it's, more like the, it's more like the elevation of moral posturing about sensitivity over truth. It's even worse. Where did it come from? Why did we get, how did we get to this place where we're so fragile, the safe space people? I think that you can pretty much blame it on the universities. I think that they've pursued, a, especially in the humanities and, and in the social sciences as well, they've pursued a policy of a radical leftist policy with, with an overlay of, of postmodernism, which kind of a literary criticism uh, approach that's produced all of this. As far as I can tell, I think you can lay a lot of it at the feet of faculties like the faculties of education. I remember around a decade ago when those far left ideas on speech, racism and gender politics started to take over the university campuses. And yet most people still underestimated how they would spill over across society in a few short years. That's precisely what we're seeing as it regards the debate around political correctness. If you want evidence of that, I think the wave of protests around a decade ago against microaggressions in university campuses revealed exactly the trajectory that America has headed. The educational institutes became an incubation center for a whole new mindset about to take over corporations, media, and institutions in the next decade. Of course, that's precisely what happened, and remember Bill C-16 in Canada mandating the use of preferred gender pronouns? That also began from university campuses around 2015, embroiling Jordan Peterson into controversies with students and the administration. One thing is clear, there is a generational shift that's happening in the country, and it's taking with it a foundational principle of America which is free speech for the pursuit of truth. It has been said when you try to be politically correct, you're almost always factually incorrect. And what's most interesting is that it's an idea that was first born in communist societies where political correctness meant towing the party line. Modern America seems to have taken it and applied it from the left in the name of sensitivity. In all this confusion, I cannot help but remember an incredible quip by the late Christopher Hitchens when someone had their feelings hurt he simply said, quote, Oh, you're offended? I'm still waiting to hear what your argument is. Hitchens was certainly a more abrasive figure than Jordan Peterson, but I do see a common thread between them on balancing free speech and offense. That's because it doesn't even have to be a balancing act most of the time, since free speech necessitates the right to offend. That is what our education has forgotten. There was a, an article in the, in the Chronicle of Higher Education this week just that would just, just devastated the faculties of education, taking them to task for low academic standards and for possession by ideology and for, and for, and for 
basically indoctrinating people in a cult-like manner and playing identity politics and group identity. And, and no free speech. They, yeah, they don't well, seem to, there, there was an incident in Fresno State. I don't know if you saw this, but Barbara Bush died. Okay, some professor there tweeted something nasty. Mm -hmm. yeah. I wouldn't have tweeted it. it. She called Barbara Bush a racist and said she raised war criminals. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, it's... it's <laughs> Yeah, well, the timing. This crowd likes it, yeah. but, but it, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's nasty. And, and she's, uh, they're considering suspending her. And here's what the president of the university said. He said, this was beyond free speech. This was disrespectful. Have we, have we lost the thread back to knowing well, what free speech is? Yes, it can be disrespectful. That is covered under free speech. Well, and you see, you see this too. I, I think where, where it's manifesting itself in a particularly appalling manner is in the increasing unwillingness of comedians, for example, to go on university campuses to be funny. I call these people emotional hemophiliacs. You know, it's like the least little thing will make them start to bleed. But what, it makes me, because they, their answer is not to go into a room full of sharp objects. <laughs> the answer is to make all of us wear bubble wrap. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. So nothing we ever do makes them have a moment of discomfort. Well, there's, it's it's well, there's really also, very narcissistic. Well, there, there's also this idea that's promoted by the people who are protecting those who are easily offended, that the way to make people secure is to protect them from things that they don't want to encounter. And right. there isn't a clinician, uh, uh, like I'm a trained clinical psychologist, and there isn't a clinician in the country who's worth his or her salt that would ever make that claim. Because you don't make people, first of all, it's hard to make people safe because life is seriously not safe. Yes. And the way, that you make, the way that you make people resilient is by exposing them to things that they're afraid of and that make them uncomfortable voluntarily, but you use exposure. Right. And it's a... And so, like, if you, if you over-coddle people, if you protect them from everything that's sharp, you make them dull and stupid and, 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 <laughs> and narcissistic, and it's a really bad idea. By the way, that incident grabbed quite a lot of attention and controversy back in 2018 when Professor Rhonda Jarrar ripped into the late Barbara Bush on X, formerly Twitter, because she apparently didn't like the Bush family and the presidents for their alleged war crimes using some pretty inflammatory words. Was this completely uncalled for? Absolutely. But the real test of your commitment to free speech is when you despise what is being said, and the precedent of tolerance always needs to be respected so someone after you doesn't take advantage of it. Obstructing free speech and the flow of ideas always comes with a cost to its larger mechanism, and you very quickly find out that the cost is never really worth it. I've sometimes thought about the free flow of speech and dialogue as the renal system of a society. It's how society roots out bad ideas for good ones and makes sure everyone is on board in deciding which idea is popular and accepted. Unfortunately, when it comes to our modern society, that vital process has been obstructed by half-baked political ideologies that divide people up on a tribal basis while striking at the knee of individualist spirit that used to define us. In fact, we may actually be able to point out why that is, which is because of the rescinding religious component in the country that's creating a void for past tribalism to fill. This truth is encapsulated in what is one of my favorite quotes by Jordan Peterson ever, quote, ideologies are like crippled religions. They are like a religion that's missing an arm and a leg, but can still hobble along and it provides a certain amount of security and group identity, but it's warped and twisted, demented and bent. I mean, your book is fantastic. And one of the rules that I really love is you say, don't let your kids do anything that would make you not like them. Mm. That's what I, I've been thinking for years. Mm. People don't like to admit that they can dislike their children or children in general. And <laughs> one of the things you see very commonly as a, as a clinical psychologist is families who, family members who hate each other and who it's like they have their hands around each other's necks for 20 years and are squeezing very slowly trying to strangle each other. And so, and you see parents who clearly detest their children and have ever since they were born. And part of that, I know it's a terrible way of looking at things, but it's true. It's so and true. Because the thing is about, about little kids is, is that little kids have a, have a wonderful element to them. And if they, and most people spontaneously like little kids, they'll give them a chance. And if you have little kids, one of the things that's so wonderful about it is that when you bring them out into the world, even people who are, aren't in good shape, rough people, and who, who, who maybe don't have much patience for humanity, 
it brings out the best in them, you know? And so people are willing to give your kids a chance, but then if they misbehave, especially if they're rude and, and they don't have any respect and they're whiny and they don't know how to listen, then people don't like your kids and you don't. And then the kids, your kids go out into a world where no one likes them. I think parents are afraid of exercising authority because they tend to think that authority will crush the creative spirit of their child. No. Well, I, that is... <laughs> See, everything this man says, I think is common sense. I, he's, you you're, guys you're, should have a baby together. Yeah, we should have a baby together. I think this advice, even though it may sound harsh at first, is actually a long-term cure to much of the intellectual and moral weaknesses we see today. That's because we've gone seriously wrong with socializing our children in a way that makes them feel entitled to making the world a softer place, instead of themselves a stronger person. If children can be molded into a stronger and more socially aware version of themselves, they will grow up to tolerate dissent, offense, and free dialogue. Psychologists have often spoken about how the age of four is a vital turning and maturation point in a child's life. That's when it becomes imperative that they mingle and associate with other children to learn the unspoken rules of social interaction and develop healthy bonds as a result. So, in the end, the behavior that the child takes on is socially negotiated from a young age, and if we're looking for the one time frame most sensitive to long-term change in individuals and society, then that is it. Perhaps that's why Rule 5 in Jordan's 12 Rules to Life says, quote, Don't let your children do anything that makes you dislike them. What I love most about Jordan Peterson is that he doesn't just show society the way, but also gives them the smallest and most proximal step they can take to get there. That's why he tells us to pet a cat as a metaphor to appreciate the small things in life and to at least not lie to get closer to the truth in our lives. And perhaps that is what has made him such an intellectual phenomenon on the world stage. He's provided millions of people with a ladder to climb while at the same time keeping the steps small enough for everyone to reach.